There's something called the paradox of Theseus. If you replace one by one every single part of a ship with a similar part, when does it stop being the same ship? Applying that to a human being, should you replace every single part of a human with amazing prosthetics that simulate precisely what we, for all intents and purposes, are? Does it stop being human? And should we manufacture an entire being with those parts? What is it? Human? Transhumanism is a fascinating subject that has been tackled by some of my favorite pieces of fiction, like Transmetropolitan or Ghost in the Shell. The dream of the moral question we will be asking in the future. What is a human? Who are we? Our life, our meaning, our existence, so on, so forth. However, there has never been anything to portray the basic question in such a beautiful and poignant way than Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. Full disclosure, I love this movie. There are very few works of fiction in this world that I would consider as beautiful and wonderful as Blade Runner. This is not a review. This is me gushing over something I adore and bitching about how it's being thrown into the Hollywood machine along with the rest of the so-called soft reboots that have people's nostalgia all wrapped up and ready to pro proclaim a new age of greatness filled with nothing except what they liked as kids prepackaged in a more consumable way by today's audience. It's the basis for most of the modern cyberpunk aesthetic that we know nowadays. Yet, it's the one work of fiction where that aesthetic was done with the greatest amount of care and beauty. It's dark and depressingly industrial, yet will always be hypnotized into a state of comfortable dreams by its neon lights and cool atmosphere. Blade Runner exudes a sort of wonderful sadness that has never been captured or most likely ever will be. It's a far cry from the book it was originally based on, as well as any of its sequels. It's a unique work, yet people, what people expect of it, or even remember, is likely completely different from what it offers. A lone badass detective bounty hunter is called back into the fold to terminate a few robots that have gone rogue, kill people, and are considered a danger to society. We've seen this kind of, of plot a thousand times. Oh, Harrison Ford, who was in the peak of his popularity as Han Solo and Indiana Jones, the quintessential good guy action heroes, was playing the main character, Deckard. What else could this movie have been except a good old tussle between the good and bad guys with plenty of action and entertainment? Replicants, how this movie portrays them, are manufactured beings indistinguishable from humans with thoughts and emotions. Slaves with a life duration of four years. The intro portrays one with strange and sociopathic behaviors, blurting out basic sentences and lashing out at what he can't understand. A villain if we've ever seen one. The reluctant hero is called back from his retired life in order to once again fearlessly take on the evil robots. Forcefully, forcefully kill the evil robots. When Deckard goes to meet Tyrell, the creator of the replicants, portrayed as a sort of God Pharaoh at top, a brilliant pyramid. He shows him his finest creation, Rachel, like a perfect porcelain doll she doesn't know she's not human. Any non-human feature, undetectable. More human than human is our motto, repeated through the movie. A cold corporation that manufactures a human's idea of what a human is, and it is absolutely perfect. When the replicants 
act, speak, move in this movie, they do so in simple ways. In every single way, they are confused children, having notions of what they simply must do to survive and speaking in emotionally simple ways. They are amused, or they are fearful, or they lash out, attempting to survive. When we're shown who designed them, J.F. Sebastian, he acts like a child himself, surrounded by his dolls and acting in a childlike behavior. A young man with a disease that makes him look more decrepit each day, mirroring the four-year lifespan of the replicants. When the first replicant is located and killed, it's not an action sequence that we see. It's an execution. The movie's showing us how something beautiful dies. How Deckard is a cold-blooded murderer in every way. And soon after, when another of the replicants attempts to take revenge over his friend, he's gunned down as well in a second by the perfect doll we've seen before, Rachel, who Deckard has also been ordered to kill. Because, of course, she's not human. Deckard's struggle to view her as more than a thing like the ones that he mows down for a living ends up becoming a deeply uncomfortable forced sex scene. Is she something he could care for or see as a human being just like him? Roy Batty is the centerpiece of the narrative. The leader of the rogue replicants, he behaves in a more mature manner than his childlike companions, and has understanding of human morality. He questions his mortality, his life, or if he has a soul. He desperately clings to existence, his only wish to be as human as everyone else. Convincing Sebastian to take him to his father, he asks for the obvious. More life, a chance to experience it just like everyone else. The god pharaoh cannot give this to him. No one can grant life. Roy, in desperation, is mindful of all of the sins he has committed in his life as a soldier. He asks his father for forgiveness before he ends his life. The look on his face, unpleased and horrified at what he's doing, seals his fate as a prodigal son. Returning to Sebastian's home to see his last friend's body slaughtered by Deckard, Roy loses anything that he had linking him to happiness. Lashes out at Deckard while questioning everything that we have seen so far in this movie. Isn't Deckard the good man? Does he have a soul to even believe in any sort of afterlife? Can he reach out and meet Deckard? feel the way he feels. As if he's playing around in a chase of cat and mouse, this is no confrontation. This is simply what Deckard has done to all the others. And as he's about to topple over the edge, Roy saves him in the greatest and most poignant mo moment in the movie, delivering the most amazing soliloquy as his epitaph before dying, as his life has finally run out, his four years done, and his soul ascends. In the end, after calling it quits, there's only one thing left for Decker to do. And with a small revelation that he might just be yet another replicant in the firing range, he takes Rachel and leaves, with a small hope, once again, that despite all of his sins, he might escape and be free. Blade Runner is a masterpiece with so many theatrical elements that enhanced its narrative and emotional message. It is the finest transhumanism piece of fiction ever created. Back when it was released in 82, Warner Brothers butchered its message by re-editing the original print and inserting narration pieces in a shoehorn ending in order to make Deckard look like the sympathetic hero like Harrison Ford was portrayed at the time. 
Only 10 years later, an actual director's cut was released in 92, and in 2007, the final cut version, the final movie as it was supposed to be, with complete creative control restored to the director, Ridley Scott. We finally saw the actual film. For these reasons, Blade Runner is a punk movie, not only in its experience, but also its release history and the ways in which the audience was allowed to enjoy it. It is the last movie anyone should creatively touch, because the simplicity of its story and the theatrical motif in which it is presented is what makes it so brilliant. As such, this is something that I have quite a big problem with. Any continuation of Blade Runner's story isn't just unnecessary, but couldn't possibly be done in today's big Hollywood of big overblown blockbusters. And as the trailer shows, despite a stellar cast and director, it's going to be yet another sci-fi action movie with explosions, good versus evil, and a story about something that will do mankind unless the hero stops it. Denis Villeneuve is a wonderful director, and I'm quite fond of his work, but this is not a movie that should be made at all. Three short movies were made to link Blade Runner to its sequel. The first one shows off Jared Leto's character as the typical bad guy, able to order a replicant to kill himself in front of him, just to show how obedient the new models are. The second one shows off Dave Bautista's character as a good replicant, who saves a family from a gang. Both of these are terribly linear and just glorified trailers. The third short is a bit of a Hail Mary by Shinichiro Watanabe, creator of Cowboy Bebop. It's the story of a short-lived rebellion by a group of replicants. Aside from a few details, it nails the atmosphere perfectly, and it's a wonderful way to end the story of the Tyrell Corporation and how playing God will be something that's always done by the next big corporate conglomerate. This is a satisfactory conclusion to it all, a neat little bow to wrap things in. The original brilliant work that is Blade Runner will never be taken from us, but unnecessary sequels to works as important as this will always make me sad. This is my favorite movie and I'll rewatch it for years and years to come. My hope is that this horrible trend of making quick and easy sequels to wonderful works that don't need one will one day be forgotten, and all its sequels will be lost in time, like tears and rain.